I'm sure um, that um, that your heart is heavy over uh, some of the things that are going on in our country uh, today. Um, but you know, you can't be too pessimistic when you serve the God that we serve. And uh, I want to just uh, share with you a little bit today about about um, the Lord Jesus Christ. My heart is optimistic and expectant because in these unique times, coronavirus and all the strife in the different areas of our world, that usually means that the Lord is up to something great. So in light of um, a lot of the events over the past weeks and months, I have actually a new message that doesn't align with the sermon title on the front of the messenger that you were sent out by mail. In fact, this new message doesn't even have a title. But I do want to start by reading a few Bible verses to you and just saying a few words about those verses. And I want you to listen to these verses or turn to these verses and read them. And as you read them and listen to them, I want you to, I want you to, to, um, to know that God is speaking directly and personally to you because he is and the word is true. As I said earlier, the first Bible passage is in Psalm 46, verses 1 and 2. And it says this, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. In a 2020 racked with coronavirus, political strife, racial hate, the burning of some of America's great cities, and now in 2021, the desecration of our nation's capital, people in our community are depending upon Christians, upon our church, South Main Baptist Church, to lead them to God, who is their refuge and their strength. But before we can lead people to God, who is their refuge and strength and, and, and not fear, we as believers need to recommit ourselves to God as our refuge and strength. As I preached a couple of weeks ago, it's not becoming for a child of God to show the amount of discomfort, lack of faith, anxiety, and fear that I see among so many Christians and churches. It's not becoming to see the lack of grace and civility displayed by many so-called Christians on either side of the political divide. We need an oasis of hope and confidence, an oasis of God and sharing, and an oasis of worship and praise. And that's what the church can provide, but only if it's revived. So join me, South Main Church, in a revival of kindness, doing what we've always done best, serving our community, reaching out to our world in the name of Jesus with kindness and love, not fear, because God is our refuge and strength. Therefore, the Bible says, we will not fear. The next verse of Scripture I want to call your attention to is in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 2. As the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, For I resolved to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So Paul, this great world-renowned rabbi, educated under Gamaliel, and probably a lot smarter than you or I, was saying this, I'm putting all my wisdom and talent and education in the background. And even with my great knowledge, the problems of the world are way above my abilities. So I've made a resolution. I've resolved. I've decided. I've determined while I was with you to know nothing except Jesus Christ. Now you got to realize, Rome had a lot bigger problems than we did at that time. Sexual immorality was rampant. Orgies of eating and sex were in vogue. Infanticide, the killing of unwanted babies, was an accepted part of Roman society. 30% of the Roman Empire were slaves, so slavery was rampant. Strife and violence were out of control. 
and the torture of political opponents was the rule of the day. And Paul was saying that in light of those problems, he decided that people, when he comes to preach in their synagogues or to preach on the street, they don't need to hear politics or poetry. They needed a word from God. So Paul decided that that word would be Jesus. And he says, I've decided to know nothing else except Jesus and him crucified. And we need to make that same resolution today. The problems of our country are way above our pay grade here at South Main Baptist Church. They're far above our ability and knowledge. And we need to admit that we don't know what to do. But we know someone who does, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to decide that in the coming days and weeks, we will know nothing except Jesus and leading people to him. He has the power through his crucifixion, death, and resurrection to bring a breakthrough, and nothing else can. The diseases, the disasters, and the dissension of our day are not excuses to worry, but bridges that we can use to give people hope in Jesus Christ. And in your day-to-day -day discussions about all the messed up things in our world over the next days and weeks, I want to challenge you to decide nothing about these complex issues except that Jesus can give hope and Jesus can save. And it's a decision. Paul had a lot of wisdom and knowledge. He probably could have spoken to a lot of the, the issues of the day, but he said, I've decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And a good Bible verse to start with is, uh, is uh, Titus 3, verses 4 through 6. And you might want to write that reference down. It goes like this. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth, and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And now I want to read another Bible verse to you. It harkens back to our preachers last week. The words of Jesus in John 13, verse 34, as, as Jesus commanded his disciples, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Folks, love is the word of the day. And the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 13 that if I preach and speak in the tongues of men and angels, but don't have love, the world only hears the noise of clanging cymbals. We preach Jesus and him crucified but in many churches lately, the world cannot hear that message of Jesus Christ because it is being drowned out by the clanging noise of lovelessness. Another important verse I would like to read for you today is found in the Bible in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, and it goes like this. Paul wrote, he said, but I fear, just as Eve was beguiled by the serpent's cunning lies, your minds may somehow be led astray from the simplicity that is in Christ. The simplicity that is in Christ. In other words, the Apostle Paul was expressing concern to his readers that just as Eve was led astray by the devil's lies in the Garden of Eden, that their minds were wandering away from the simple devotion to Jesus Christ. They were starting to chase rabbits. Churches don't need to chase rabbits. We need to, we need to preach Christ and him crucified. Folks, when my life gets too complicated, it usually means that I'm out of God's will. When I'm in the center of God's will, life is so simple. It's just childlike, following Christ. 
And many Christians today lie awake at night worrying about problems they can't solve and have never been solved, called to solve. So trust in Jesus Christ. Don't let the devil complicate your life worrying about all the messed up things in this world that you personally can't do anything about anyway. God will take care of any and all problems in our world and in your life. But only if you follow your calling. And your calling is to trust in Jesus and walk with him in simplicity on this great adventure for which he created us. You remember in the Bible when the children of Israel were backed up against the Red Sea with no hope? Pharaoh's army was closing in they had the sea on one side Pharaoh's army on the other side and they had no hope and then uh, Moses said to them in Exodus 14 13 he said to them look don't be afraid just stand still you remember that don't be afraid just be still and then you know what happened a great wind came and the Red Sea parted and the children of Israel went through to freedom. So why are you standing on the shore fretting? It's my dream that the church of Jesus Christ, Christians, black, white, rich and poor, men and women, every nation, every language, would join hands together as believers and walk through to victory. But many seem to be trying to generate that wind by themselves. Trying to part the ocean's waters in their own strength. Folks, the next time you're at Myrtle Beach, I want you to try that. Just go out about waist deep in the ocean and using your own hands or using maybe a little tin can, try to part that ocean in half and create a walkway to walk through. Just try it. And you will soon see the utter futility of that endeavor. And when it comes to our nations and politics and, polit and policy, many of you are trying to use your own human strength or maybe some little tin can of some political party, whether Republican or Democrat, or some little tin can of some 70-year-old white politician named Trump or Biden, and you're trying to part the Red Sea. And all the while, God is saying, just stand still and see my glory. I'll make a way for you. We've all been reminded lately that over allegiance to any human or human institution is doomed. Folks, Republicans or Democrats will ultimately fail you. Folks, I'm a pastor, but preachers will ultimately fail you. Politicians will disappoint you. I'm a Baptist, but denominations, Baptists, Methodists, Catholics, Presbyterians, and Pentecostals will all let you down. But Jesus will never let you down. Our allegiance and identity is to the Lord alone. Our primary identity is not in our political party or even in our families or our jobs or our education or our gender, or our blackness, or our whiteness. As believers, we find our identity primarily in Jesus Christ. And we've all found out over the past year that over allegiance to anything else, any institution, any party, any preacher, any politician, any denomination will let you down. But Jesus will never let you down. Paul in the Bible said it this way. In verse 8 of Philippians chapter 3, he said this. He said, I consider everything in my life trash compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ as my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. Philippians 3.8. Paul is saying there that whatever bad things or good things he has had in life, he considers them all rubbish or literally dung. The word in Greek is skibalon. 
We get the word scat from this word. Refuse, excrement, rubbish, dregs. Paul is saying whatever bad or good I have in my life, I consider it skibalon, dung, compared to the surpassing worth of just simply knowing Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord. Based on that passage of Scripture, Paul is saying, folks, it's time to take the trash out. All of your worries, all of your cares, all of your anger, all of your bitterness, all of your sorrow, all of your perplexities, just take them to the dumpster. Throw them away and take up Christ, for he will never let you down. I know I've been accused of being an incurable optimist of saying that in weird, strange times, it means God's at work. And, and I've, also been, I've also been accused of being very simplistic. Oh, just pray and trust in Jesus. How shallow that is. And my answer is this. I challenge you to do it then. Simply trust in Jesus Christ. Just do it and prove me wrong. And prove the Bible wrong. But I'm not wrong. And the Bible's not wrong. If you take out the rubbish of worry and throw your allegiance totally upon Christ, you will be so fresh and free and victorious. And it's wonderful. As I read these verses and other Bible verses over the past few days, I truly believe that the Lord is telling our church and our world this. God will not use wise people to solve the problems of this world. But God will use simple people, prayerful people, people who know nothing except Christ and Him crucified. The verses I've read to you today, they're simple verses, but they're not shallow verses. Because these words in the Bible are true. And... Um, you know, the problem with the Bible is this. Like the instructions that we got on the Roomba that we got for Christmas, uh, these were, those instructions, I found out something. They only work if you follow them. They only work if you follow them. And not only following Jesus' words and commands, but also following His character, preaching the gospel, Helping the loveless, loving the helpless, and most of all, reaching the lost. And now more than ever today, we seek to be the church, an oasis of light in the desert of darkness that we face in our nation today. And that's really exciting because in dark times, if the church gets it right, we can shine even brighter as that oasis of light Christianity back in Bible times was small poor persecuted but they were making great strides in reaching people and transforming lives and how did they do it by wisdom and power and knowledge and sophistication no they did it through the gospel of Jesus Christ they had no other power they were not able to lobby and rub shoulders with the power brokers in the temple. They weren't invited to the cocktail parties by either party in the Roman Empire, the Senate or the Caesars. But they did have one thing, the transformative power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. These Jesus people were far from the traditional seats of political power as far as Greenwood, South Carolina is from Washington, D.C. But they had their own power, the resurrection power of the gospel. And I doubt that these early Christians stayed up late at night worrying about whether Julius Caesar was right when he crossed the Rubicon or whether Emperor Augustus would be supplanted by the Roman Senate. But I do imagine that these Jesus people did stay up nights praying for their neighbors who were lost and on their way to a Christless eternity unless they intervened. These Jesus people didn't come across as know-it-alls because they knew nothing except Christ and Him crucified. 
And they didn't come across as being above it all because they readily acknowledged the foolishness of things like forgiving your enemies or praying for those who persecute you. But they were below it all, serving, washing feet, helping people like them, helping people not like them. In South Maine, we've always been at our best when we've been serving our community, serving others, below it all, helping, washing feet. One of the pastors here in town described the sweet grandmother who would always say, just remember to pray for your enemies. You just might turn them into friends. You see, she was one of those Jesus people. You've heard me uh, uh, sp- uh, preach about the late Dory Van Stone, one of the a legendary personal witness for Jesus Christ, who was just really a simple little old lady who loved people and told them about Jesus. Stories abound of her walking up to a group of streetwalkers in Houston, Texas, and telling them how beautiful they were and leading them to the Lord. Or going up to an outlaw biker gang and admiring the intricate skill and time it must have taken to ink their skull tattoos and then leading them to Jesus. Or walking up to a group of goths and asking them if it hurt when they got their piercings and then leading them to Jesus. See, she was one of those Jesus people, those sweet Jesus people that just seemed to know nothing except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. These these people that Dory Van Stone walked up to, um, street walkers, outlaw bikers, goths, and other people, they were special to her. She saw their worth and how precious they were. So think about that. Think about that Jesus person in your life. That Christian grandmother who was always prayerful and peaceful and godly and never seemed to worry much about anything. Will our children and will our grandchildren ever have a parent or grandparent that they can think about to inspire them? Or think, about, or think about that guy in high school, when you were in high school. You know that guy who was nice and who wore the Christian t-shirt and who always brought his Bible to school and, and, um, and everybody kind of made fun of him, but they secretly respected him. I ask a few of our students, I, I, I ask them if that guy or gal still existed in high school today. I said, do you have, a, do you have that guy or girl in high school that we used to have? They, you know, they wear the Christian t-shirt, and a lot of our kids wear Christian t-shirts, but they bring their Bible, and they just really have that smile, and they're just really on it for Jesus all the time. And, and uh, at least the group that I talked to said, no, they uh, really didn't have that guy or that gal in school today. What a tragedy. What a tragedy. We worry about the incremental erosion of our freedom of religion. That our grandchildren may never get to worship freely or freely tell others about Christ or freely meet for worship. But I'm far more worried that our grandchildren will never meet a true Christian. Someone like Dory Van Stone or Ernie Simmons, the meanest man in the county who got saved and couldn't say the word Jesus without tears filling his eyes after he came to the Lord. I wonder what kind of Christian our children and grandchildren will visualize when they think of the prominent Christian believers in our nation and in our churches today. Will they think about that Christian grandmother that we think about that had her Bible and she just said don't worry just pray or Dory Van Stone that little old lady witnessing to people or that dopey Christian kid in high school that brought his Bible will they have that image what what will they think about when they think hey I want you to think about your 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 greatest Christian in your life and and they think and think and think and they say uh, and uh, and they Boy, my grandma was a great Christian. She fought, argued, obsessed, and fretted me to Jesus. 
What will, what will our children and grandchildren think of the greatest Christians in your life? Oh man, I come from a long line of judgmental worriers. What will our grandchildren think of when they think of that godliest Christian in their life? Oh, I remember I come from a long line of polarized arguers, worldly brawlers, constantly in the fray. I don't want Jerry Falwell Jr. or Jeremiah Wright to be what our grandkids think about when they think of a Christian. I want to challenge you to do something radical today. I want you to trust in Jesus Christ. That every word that you write, every sentence on Facebook that you post, everything you say about politics, elections, would be seasoned with salt, sharing the life-changing hope of the gospel, the good news about Jesus Christ, and how Jesus can solve the problems in our nation and world because he can, and that's why I'm an optimist. You can't be a pessimist when you serve the God we serve. We live in a dark time, but as I said earlier, it's in the dark times that the good news of Jesus shines the brightest. And folks, at this time when the gospel can shine so bright, some of you are still wallowing in the darkness. Folks, this is the time to let our light shine. But we can't do it if we're worried, polarized, and partisan. Every person that you meet even somebody diametrically opposed to you is an opportunity for you to show the adventurous, radical, life-changing love of Jesus Christ. And folks, the, the darkness hates the light. So the Bible says not to be surprised if the world hates you. When you go the route of simple love and service, sometimes both sides accuse you of being sellouts because we have English is a second language here. We've been accused of being open border socialists. But at the same time, we're pro-life and pro-adoption. And we've been accused of being radical bigots. Because of our work on racial reconciliation, we've been called social justice warriors. And at the same time, because we have a high view of the reliability and infallibility of Scripture, we've been called right-wing fundamentalists. But the only camp or category I care about is the camp of Jesus Christ and his word. Jesus had in his 12 disciples, Simon the Zealot, who advocated the radical overthrow of the Roman government, and Matthew, a tax collector, who was in cahoots with the Roman government. Philip was an inept complainer, and Nathaniel judged people based on where they were from. Yet they were all invited to come and follow Jesus. And I'm going to invite you to come and follow Jesus as well. As our band comes, I want to tell you a story. Uh, band, you are going to do a closing song, right? All right, come here and get ready because we're going to, it's going to be great. And I think it's going to be on the altar, right? Oh, come to the altar because I've got something to say about the altar. Um. While our band comes, I just want to tell you a story from history. Back, back in the 1700s, you know, the Enlightenment, back in the 1700s, deism was a popular but unbiblical theology. Now, let me tell you what deism is. Um, they taught that God created the heaven and the earth. There was one God who created the heavens and the earth, but that he was distant and no longer active in the world. Now, you'll remember this term from your history lesson in, in high school. They thought of God as the divine watchmaker. How, how many of you have heard that term? The divine watchmaker. And, and deism thought of God as the divine watchmaker who crafted the earth and, and wound it up like a watch, but then just flung it into space. And now, the, now he is largely absent from the world, and the world's just ticking down on its own. A God who created the heaven and the earth, but who is now largely absent from the lives of his followers. So the deists thought 
that yeah, we believe in God, and we even believe some of them in the principles from God's word, but we've kind of largely been left to ourselves to do the best we can. Folks, you know where I'm going on this. I'm afraid even though some people may not know the term deism and maybe haven't formally adopted the theology of deism and the practical outworkings of your life, some of you are deists. You confess that God created the heavens and the earth, but you feel like you've largely been left on your own to work it out the best you can without the power of a personal Lord and Savior and how wrong you are. Many so-called Christians, maybe even some in this room today, are really deists. You're acting like you don't believe in a powerful God who is still active in the world. Worrying, complaining, trying to work things out on your own human power and ingenuity. Many act like God isn't even present or active in the world. But like that great Christmas hymn by Longfellow, God is not dead, nor does he sleep. God is still active and alive and well in the world. And so like I said at the first part of my message in Psalm 42, this God who doesn't sleep, who is still active in our world, this God is our refuge and strength therefore we will not fear you can trust him the Lord will never let you down let us pray folks as your heads are bowed and as your eyes are closed the solutions to the problems in our world are not in a plan but they're in a person, Jesus Christ. And the solutions to the problems of our world are also not in a plan, but in a place, the altar of prayer. And so wherever you are, listening by radio, driving down the street, at home, streaming this service, here in person, Wherever you are, that place where you are needs to become an altar of prayer. What is that altar? It's the place where God is waiting. Whether you keep your quiet time with Him or not, whether you keep your appointment with Him or not, God shows up at that altar. He's not just a divine watchmaker that wound the world up and flung it into space and it's winding down on its own. No, he's there at the altar waiting for his appointment with you to lead you, to guide you, to direct you, to give you peace, to give you confidence, to give you a future and a hope. And some of you are running around doing everything on your to-do list except keeping that appointment. And the irony is, the only place of fulfillment, the only place of salvation, the only place with solutions is that that one altar, that place that you've been neglecting. Paul wrote, I determined to, nothing, to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified Lord Jesus I pray that you'll just make us so simple that like that godly Christian grandmother we sit with our Bible in our lap and say don't worry God will take care of it just pray for that enemy God may turn him into a friend Lord Jesus, help me to put you first and only in my life. And that's what salvation is all about.